Hello and welcome. I'm Claudia Rizzini, the Executive Director of the Rackley Fellowship Program at Harvard University. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Kim Vaz Deville, our Lillian Golly Canoffel Fellow. Before sunrise on Mardi Gras, many African Americans don regalia adorned with hand sewn details, infused with historical significance and spiritual practices. Crowds gathered to witness vibrant centuries old traditions sustained by black maskers. Growing up, Kim was steeped in Mardi Gras festivities, drawn to the creativity that shines through the Mardi Gras costumes. Kim was enamored by masking Mike's King's ability to bring visibility to a historically marginalized group. Every Mardi Gras, groups of black women take to the streets dressed in Victorian era dresses, bonnets, and bloomers as baby dolls. In her book, The Baby Dolls, Kim traces this phenomenon through scholarly research interwoven with the oral histories, photographs, and first-hand encounters. In her follow-up anthology, Walking Ruddy, The Baby Dolls of New Orleans, Kim foregrounds the voices of women who are contemporary baby dolls, inviting a broader audience to engage with this rich dynamic history. More broadly, the anthology highlights how masking has empowered black women, both past and present. During her time at Radcliffe, Kim is writing a book that tells the story of African-American maskers and the spirituality imbued in their practice during Mardi Gras. Grounded in a decade of ethnographic and underground research, Kim focuses on masking traditions that blend Afro-diasporic roots with local New Orleans culture. Such traditions both celebrate African and Afro-Caribbean culture and bring visibility to the diaspora's glo global struggles against exploitation. Today, the Q&A sessions of the talk will be moderated by Cynthia Baker, Chair and Professor of History of Art and Architecture at Boston University. It is my pleasure to welcome Kim to the podium. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody at home. <laughs> hey, yeah, all right, and let's do, let's use our outside voices. Good morning, everybody. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to Dean Brown Nagin, Director Rizzini, and the staff of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, and to this year's distinguished fellows. It's a privilege and honor to be in the company of such visionaries. You all have inspired me. We've had a lot of fun together, <laughs> and I'm grateful. Henry Bird, better known as Professor Longhair, wrote and performed one of the most popular Mardi Gras songs in history. The lyrics are like this. If you go to New Orleans, you ought to see the Mardi Gras. And when you go to see the Mardi Gras, somebody will tell you what Mardi Gras is for. I intend to tell you about a side of Mardi Gras that's hidden, not because it's a secret, but because given the current practice of Fat Tuesday inversion rituals, one does not expect to see spirituality emerging from the nooks and crannies of urban spaces. I'll be sharing how individual maskers use their spirituality to resist dominant modes of Christianity or Christianity itself because Western religion is tied to the exploitation of African descended people. Mardi Gras roots has its, has its roots in pre-Christian festivals, which were later intertwined into the framework of Catholic, the Catholic liturgical calendar. The New Orleans Carnival begins on January 6, the 12th night after Christmas. And it's celebrated the Tuesday preceding Ash Wednesday, which can between, be between anywhere from February 3rd to March 9th, depending on when Easter falls. Entrance into black masking practices is by birth or invitation. Prepare, preparations are intense and in some cases take a year, and the regalia made can not be reworn the next Mardi Gras. Using the cloak of satire, Mardi Gras enabled African Americans to ridicule prevailing status quo and display identities that were more consistent with how they felt about themselves as self-valuing people living in a hostile environment. 
James Cressy, a cotton farmer and slaveholder and writer who attended the 1835 New Orleans Mardi Gras noted this. He said, there are men and boys, women and girls, bond and free, white and black, yellow and brown, exerting themselves to invent and, and appear in grotesque, quizzical, diabolical, horrible, humorous, strange masks and disguises. They march on foot, on horseback, in wagons, carts, coaches, cars, in rich confusion, up and down the streets, wildly shouting, singing, laughing, drumming, fiddling, and throwing flour as they go their reckless way. But over time, the economic elite viewed the unregulated activity permitted by the Creole people, and by Creole I mean those people who were defined as Catholic, French-speaking, and born in the Louisiana colony. Those elite people said, this is way too chaotic, chaotic and way too egalitarian. The elite strove to project themselves as white upper class men. Those were the real spectacles of carnival, they felt. Their fascination with a military processional form went beyond admiration. They memorialized the modality, turning it into a symbol of their right to be publicly anonymous. The mask became their group's signature, ensuring them of the privilege, of, of their privilege as they claimed, claimed it on the public streets. Most importantly, they filled Mardi Gras with symbols of white supremacy. For example, the theme of the 1930 crew of MoMA's parade was themed Father Time's Holidays, and it celebrated the freedoms of white men in the Western world. Carnival illustrator Perry Young articulated the racial hierarchy of Mardi Gras quite starkly. He said, in the white parades, no element is more essential or more sincerely part and parcel than the 1,000 or 1,500 black torchbearers and mule herds, white shrouded, cow, that dance before the cars between them, alongside them, toiling but dancing. They think that they belong and they earn the affiliation, a dollar a piece they get or a dollar and a half. The way is long, the asphalt is hard, the blazing torches are hot and heavy, but they dance, not for the dollar and a half. They do it being part of the parade, a part that can't be done with like the cook, the chambermaid, the scrub woman, the black mammy. They all admire them. But they um, admire them as much as the madam on the avenue admires her masked son and heir, who's her lord and master, or her fine chosen true love. My presentation's broken down into four parts, beads, threads, fabrics, and knots. In beads, I address the carnival traditions that go back 100 years and that are being modified by some in the black masking community through the use of spiritual iconography and ritual. In threads, I cover the maskers who be began to discuss their practices in terms of spirituality, even if not necessarily manifesting itself in their regalia. In fabrics, I cover a few examples of those masking traditions today, or those masking today who have consciously incorporated spiritual themes into their regalia and performances. In knots, I cover some of the contradictions that exist in the traditions, these traditions that were formed in the cru under the crucible of Jim Crow, and how even in their transformation, there is still the risk of reinforcing hegemony. Beads. The artistry of black masking community relies on precision cut uniform seed beads that come in a variety of colors, each is hand sewn onto the fabric. The beads of contemporary African American masking traditions were sewn under Jim Crow and grounded in the popular culture of the time. Minstrelsy, vaudeville, the red light districts, exclusive male carnivals, stereotypes of Africans and indigenous people. 
The black masking traditions that have emerged and have, are over now 100 years old, the baby dolls, the Indians, and the skeletons, and two I will not focus on in this presentation, the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club and black debutante balls. These are practices that are similar in the black uh, car Caribbean carnivals. These are our beads. This is where we started, the skeletons. According to Albert Morris, the last mid-century Northside Skull and Bone gang member, the story goes back to a merchant marine who brought the tradition into the city. Before dawn on Mardi Gras Day, the skeletons would emerge from the cemetery, wielding large, bloody bones. The more meat on them, the better. They chase people uh, that they find on the streets of the Treme area and those who show fear. Their function is to remind people to live a moral and upright, upright life or meet an early death. Their signature motto is, you next, or it's too late. <laughs> this is one of the first pictures of the black masking Indians, uh, 1915. In New Orleans, African-American men celebrate Mardi Gras by adorning themselves in detailed costumes, carefully crafted by hand. The costumes pay homage to the traditional dress of American Plains Indians and the intricate beadwork of the Yoruba people of Nigeria. The origins of these costumes can also be traced to Africa and to influences from the Caribbean. There's uh, much um, controversy whether these came out of the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. Some, say, some historians say yes, Mardi Gras maskers say no, but nonetheless, um, in the very beginning, they used turkey feathers fish scales, bottle, top, bottle caps, recycled beads taken from evening attire, and ribbons. The baby dolls. The baby dolls are groups, at that time were men and women, um, who wore Victorian short dresses and bloomers, and they used the cloak of satire to make fun of the gendered rules used against them. Women smoked cigars, wore short skirts, showed their bloomers, went into whites-only bars and danced on the counters and put money they made themselves in their garters while they pranced around the city on Mardi Gras, be beginning around 1912. And so, I want to show you a scene from 1929. I want to point out that um, the way that um, one of the black maskers went to protect uh, the drummer who had been touched by the white woman, uh, you know, this was a group of black people going through a white crowd in 1929. They could have easily been lynched. It could have turned into something. And also the way that the white woman, you can't really hear it, but when she's asking this one baby doll, she's like, I know you, I know you. And this baby doll goes like, you know, like, you, you know, whatever, you don't know me. <laughs> Something she couldn't do at her job. Threads. All beads are fastened down with the thread of the, of the sower's choice. It's become practice that a simple finger prick turns into a sacred ritual as the bloody thread intertwines with the fabric of the suit, infusing it with, the vita with its vitality and potency. Over time, this practice has become a tradition representing how pouring their life energy uh, is poured into their art. The following maskers are the earliest to define the spirit as central to their practices, even if their regalia did not necessarily reflect it. Allison Montana. Um, uh, Allison uh, Montana was an Afro-Creole Catholic known for creating, inventing really, a three-dimensional architectural style of suit. I recommend Googling him. 
while parading on Mardi Gras Day or during Indian practice, and this is when the group of African-American men would get together and play tambourines, do chanting, uh, because there's a whole song tradition that goes with it. There are symbols that they have to learn um, because there are suited positions, and every suited position has a particular ritual that's carried out. But anyway, so in practices, they do, uh, according to um, Mr. Montana, he says, um, the Indians describe the spirit coming over them. Longtime observer, poet Kalamo Yasalam, describes it as entering a state of possession, resembling catching the spirit rituals of the black, of black church services, or the loa, riding them during voodoo ceremonies. And Montana said this way, if you're for real and you do it for all those years like I did with no excuse, they can't hold you back when you get on the dance floor. It's just like a sister in church. You're dancing with a spirit, with a feeling. If there are five or six other chiefs in my practice, I'll dance, I'll outdance all of them. And they're short-winded and they have to go outside looking for air. And I'll still be on the dance floor, soaking wet, looking like I can't stop. My duty is to outdance every one of them. I'm just dancing with a spirit. I'm not dancing to just be dancing. And then there's Donald Harrison Sr. Donald Harrison Sr. was the big chief of the Guardians of the Flame a group founded in 1987, and he once told an interviewer, he saw the black Indians of Carnival as a spiritual tradition fusing the slave dances in the antebellum Congo Square with American Indian cultural influences, and further back to the ring dances and burial ceremonies of West Africa. In his words, people go to churches of organized religion. He too was a Catholic. It's a religious experience for them, but when I'm into that Indian thing, it's a religious experience for me. I live it year round. It's something for your inner self expressed through your outer self. Victor Harris. Victor Harris uh, had been in Allison, Montana's tribe, a man who he esteemed and loved and cherished. When Harrison took part in, the rec in recording a song that unknowingly included the name of Montana's tribe on the label, Harrison was summarily dismissed from the tribe. No one would speak to him. He was in exile, and he was devastated. That was in 1984. It led for him, his dark night of the soul, to a visitation of the spirit. The spirit, fa ya ya came to him. It was a new spirit that he would embody over the next 50 years in his masking practice. Harris was also motivated by an encounter he had while he was still masking with Alice in Montana but he couldn't act on it until he was out of Montana's tribe. During Mardi Gras, Harris had a conversation with a European tourist who had come all the way from Europe and confessed to mistakenly assuming that the black community members were Native, Native Indians. This conversation strengthened Harris's commitment to his culture and his identity as a black man. Um, they, they are one of the most spiritual groups um, in terms of our masking traditions. And Camille Nialata, who's a professional dancer, has been given a new role in the spirit of Fayaya's group. According to Camille, she says the chief felt he needed a clearance when he moved the tribe through the streets, especially at the crossroads. Whenever we are into the crossroad, especially in the larger ones, I'm always ahead of him. I clear it up with smoke energy, water, and alcohol, and she brings the spirit of Eshu Alegba. It's an important responsibility, and the chief loves it. Fabrics. A variety of fabrics are used to make black masking regalia. Satin and canvas are the most common. Satin is the most popular carnival fabric across racial lines. Among some black maskers, satin fabric is placed over the, uh, the cardboard design pieces that are used in three-dimensional suit making. So there's three-dimensional suit making, and then there's the flat storytelling suit making. Others bead directly onto stretched pieces of bleached canvas to construct beaded portraitures. The Northside Skull and Bone Gang is still in existence. Bruce Barnes inherited the Bone Gang from Albert Morris. Albert Morris did not credit the tradition to African or Haitian spirituality. Morris said, a lot of people ask us if we're Zulu, if we're voodoo, if we're hoodoo, he said, we're none of those. The spiritual elaboration of the Bone Gang, though, was increased substantially under the leadership of Bruce Barnes and Zohar, the big chief, and Zohar Israel, the second chief. 
Bruce Barnes has dreams, and these dreams guide him in the making of his skulls. The gang begins Mardi Gras in the cemetery, where they pray, sing, entertain the ancestors, and invite the ancestors to take a walk with them. They have African drumming, and, and they um, go around, going into people's houses, and saying to people, you better get your life right, you better avoid violence, you better avoid drugs, or else you literally are gonna be carnival, meaning the flesh is gonna be coming off of your bones. So there are moral authorities. Zohar, um, this is Zohar, this particular carnival. Zohar introduced stilt dancing, or shakaba, as it's known in the West African tradition that he learned it in. And he introduced it to the skull and bone gang. Shakaba is a masquerade performance for healing and for addressing the community's ethical issues. What Zohar brings to the Mardi Gras bone tradition is the height of the stilts, representing unlimited potential and success, and also the balance required for walking and dancing. His message signifies equilibrium in one's everyday life and towering above all troubles. All right, and back to the baby dolls. Um, I wanna show you the baby dolls. You saw the baby dolls in 1921. Here are the baby dolls in 19, I mean, 1929. Here are the baby dolls in 1981 in the Tremaine neighborhood, which is one of the oldest black neighborhoods in the, um, in the United States. And if you don't think they had a good time, <laughs> they had a good time. I love that. <laughs> and here are the baby dolls today. So um, the baby dolls still come out on Mardi Gras Day, St. Joseph night, like days of old. In the 1970s, there became these Super Sunday parades where you could just literally go and see all the costuming that everybody had done the whole year. But then they have begun to have new practices. The blessing of the street. Carol Harris, who began her baby doll masking with Eva Adams, uh, to Eva as we called her, this is her being funeralized in 2018, to Eva. Um, she go, Carol Harris goes by baby doll Kit. So this Kit decided that the, do, the new dolls needed an initiation to mediate their entrance into the tradition. On January 27, 2020, Kit organized the first blessing of the street. She was guided in her words by her spiritual father, who, keeps, who she keeps forever first. She said, in the culture, we get the lights, the camera, and the action, and we forget what our main mission is. The blessing of the street is a reminder to the baby dolls and to the people in the community and in New Orleans that we are praying woman, women, and we haven't gotten this far without a prayer. And we ask God for his help and his strength. Now, compare the idea of the blessing on the street to the 1920 footage that where they had to make their way through a potentially hostile crowd and the fact that their bodies could be accosted at will. Okay. Derek McGee, um, translated his meditations on the biblical teachings into portraits on his canvas uh, in his 2007 suit. He commemorated the stories of Jesus being crucified on the cross on his front apron. On his back apron, he had Moses parting the Red Sea. He also had Mary holding the infant child Jesus and he also had Jesus near the burning bush, and he was um, in white um, ostrich feathers. The suit caused a stir. It caused consternation, because people were like, this is not the black Indian tradition. They believe that only themes of native life before Western conquests, or images that show resistance to imperial powers was the right portraiture to use uh, on their suits. But you know, people in New Orleans go their own way. In 2018, 
the divine prince Tayameka made a Black Hawk suit. So I'll talk about Black Hawk just for a minute. Whether the Black Hawk spirit guide is the widely um, known, um, well, he's, is, uh, is, is widely worshipped in the black spiritual church tradition since the early 20th century, even, even before that. Um, and we don't know whether it's the historic Black Hawk of the Sauk Indian um, um, identity who resisted U.S. settlers. Uh, but these services, which were really, there were a lot of spirit, black spiritual churches in New Orleans in the early 1930s. And uh, they gave women uh, a real opportunity to lead and have identities that, you know, they didn't have to be domestics. The services, in, so the Black Hawk service itself included singing, praying, testifying, healing, and prophesying. The, those who have Black Hawk as their spirit guide said he's thought to help with court cases, ensuring physical safety, and addressing economic insecurities. The similarities between the black masking Indians, the black masking Indians, and uh, the black spiritual church include their emphasis on divine inspiration, the use of tambourines, spirit trance, and divine ecstasy. Uh, the relationship also extends to the inclusion of handmade Indian suits during Black Hawk services. The large feasts. Uh, that the churches would offer provided hot meals for people um, who were hungry. And it was one way that they addressed the hunger in the community. People know that, knew that they could go and, um, and get some you know, fried chicken and some potato salad and some peas and homemade cake and have a good meal once or twice a month. So um, in 2018, the Divine Prince, who is minister of the House of the Divine Prince, a voodoo spiritual church, wore the spirit of Black Hawk suit. He says that his suit demonstrates how independence-minded Native Americans are icons to the black masking Indians. With a deep connection to voodoo and its cultural significance, he sought to shed light on an overlooked part of black history. This suit exemplifies, he says, the ways black Indian masking tradition sees the connection between African and Native American peoples, featuring, featuring their shared experiences of displacement, resistance, and survival. On the back of the suit is uh, formed by a snake with the uh, focal point as the all-powerful hand, symbolizing for him the ability to see beyond the veils of dimensional space. They are his key to wisdom and medicine. Sharice Harrison Nelson is the daughter of Donald Harrison Sr. She's known as Marine, Marine Queen Reese, and she leads the Guardian of the Flame Maroon Society. She says she's a self-styled uh, practicing Catholic who incorporates the, lo the Loa and the Orisha into her spirituality. Uh, her 2019 suit here is a homage to the Yoruba Orisha Obatala, known for leadership, knowledge, justice, and the differently abled. He's also the Orisha of the White Cloth. The suit was made uh, with a quest for justice for people of African descent in mind. Its centerpiece is the staff and the judicial role with the letters BML for Black Lives Matter. The cross crucifix represents the role of Christianity in um, the disenfranchisement and suppression of people of African descent. And last night, if you had been in New Orleans, you would have been able to see what happens on St. Joseph's Night. And this was St. Joseph's Night for Sharice and Andrew Wiseman. Um, Andrew Wiseman is from Ghana. He was born into um, a, voodoo, uh, a family of voodoo ritual drummers, and he served in that suited position in the Guardians of the Flame.
All right, Cherise says, for true change to occur, we must all work towards that goal together. In this, we work in the same direction, not as adversaries, but comrades. Damon Melanson. Damon Melanson is a spy boy in one of the several suited positions. So the spy, I explained that there are suited positions and he's a spy boy. Um, and, his, and the spy boy's, boy's role is to look out as a scout for other tribes. He began masking in junior high school. In 2009, uh, he began to embrace the Rastafarian uh, religion. He said he was living Rasta 24-7. But in his 2009 suit, um, he um, ha had begun to exhibit um, some of the symbols of Rastafarianism, the Star of Solomon, um, and a, a generous use of red, black, uh, and green beads, uh, red, black, and yellow beads, symbolizing the Ethiopian flag. But in 2010, he was able to make his, um, his break. And he, this is one of three suits that he made over the last several years uh, in honor of, of um, Haile Selassie. And um, the apron on the bottom is Haile Selassie as Rastafari riding uh, on a horse. In 2018, he became the big chief of his own tribe. And um, this suit is called Ethiopia. And this is a time capsule of Ethiopia as it is of interest to, Ethiopia, uh, to the Rastafarians. This contains about 1,000 glass beads sewn on entirely by hand, representing more than 4,000 hours of work performed by himself and his wife together. Velvet ruffles surround the patches, which are embellied by yellow ostrich feathers. This is the mystic medicine man of the Golden Feather Black Masking Tribe. He calls himself the Anganga of the nation. He's a medicine man for the tribe. Um, Anganga is uh, the Kikongo word for herbalist or spiritual healer. The mystic medicine man often writes the words somewhere on his suit as a sign alerting viewers to his processional mission. Claiming his heritage of Congo, Haitian, Southern European descent, his annual suits give honor to what he calls his ancestral court. The white face accentuates the mas masker's proximity to the netherworld. This, this suit's title is called Dambala Down, From the Toes to the Crown. And so this would be something that he would chant. The seafoam brown suit's construction consists of rabbit fur, deer skin, old leather coats, and um, he carries a skull to harness the power of the dead and all the mystery that it brings. And the back contains his, his mojo bags. Um, the upside down Congo cosmogram has given birth to snakes whispering in the masker's ear. The Dambala veves, our spirit symbols, are purposely beaded upside down, rendering the religious sim symbolism unintelligible. The suit's healing message is against people who try to control others through religious dogmatism. In 2024, the mystic medicine man transitioned from making, um, and from what he had been really wanting to tr transition away from the Indian-inspired headdress to one in the, in the power headgear of the chiefs in the Yaka and Pende ethnic groups based in Congo. These hats are beaded in geometric patterns, and they contain do two doorknob handles, um, two door, door handle-like knobs, and a finial at the crown. The two horns protrude from each side of the hat and represent, representing the water buffalo, which is an esteemed um, animal for its weight and strength that the chief is thought to embody. Around his neck are mojo bags and cowrie shells and parrot feathers, uh, the type used by Yoruba diviners during initiations. Below the collar is a mask of red beads that symbolize his ancestor, Jack, who fled to Louisiana with his master from San Domingue during the Haitian Revolution. Accord, and they, um, the master settled in Ville Platte, Louisiana. And Ville Platte was known as, well, it was notorious. And his um, master treated him horribly. The title of this suit is called Temperance and Patience. Uh, according to the family, the brutality of the slave master, uh, he took it and he took it for 53 years. It became intolerable. And in, 19, in 1853, 
he took a rifle and he chased his master, took a, um, an ax and knocked down the door and he killed him. And, um, and he self-emancipated himself to great consequence, of course. Knots. If there are thousands of beads that go into the regalia of black maskers, there are hundreds of knots that secure them in place. I'm moved by this quote, we must learn to sit down together and talk about a little culture. Um, that's from the novel of Fitzroy Frazier, Wounds in the Flesh, and Sylvia Winter, who goes on to critique um, the imperialism in, um, in literary approaches at her time in the 1960s in the West Indies. For me, the message is this from them. It's not just that we live in a white supremacist world, but a white supremacist world lives in us, constitutes us, infects our imagination, and affects the creation of possible worlds. The black masking traditions that have grown out of assemblage of experiences from slavery and servitude are entangled with ideas about what constitutes resistance, and it requires community conversations. Brian Klopotic, a non-federal Choctaw with Louisiana ancestry, suggests that the narrative of affinity and honor is touching. So most black masking Indians will say, we do this in honor of the, of the Indians who hid the runaways. Uh, some of them, like Daman Melanson, have um, uh, Indian heritage. Daman lived in Mansoura, uh, Marksville area, where his father um, was from. And he learned, Daman did, not to use red beads. And so in, 19, in 2009, on his vest, he had uh, you know, red beads. But on the bottom, he didn't. And then he's transitioned all the way um, out of that. So, so Klopotic says it may be touching, um, but it is Indian play that perpetuates stereotypes uh, that Indians are in the past, that Indians are of nature, that Indians are hypermasculine. These portrayals, Klopotic asserts, are in line with the ideology of settler colonialism's white supremacist practices related to the logic of genocide and the superfluousness of native people to contemporary life. But it's not just the impact of black masking Indian tradition on native people. It's also the words and ideas we adopt because we have come to believe they're progressive. Words like indigenous. Among the um, African, some African-American maskers, they'll say, this is an indigenous African-American practice. And it means a whole lot of different things. There's also the word maroon. These words have histories that are misconstrued or not always oppositional as they may seem. And there are some ideas that form the basis of nationalist religions that are featured in black Mardi Gras regalia that herald hierarchy and gendered politics that reinforce hypermasculinity. Interrogating and becoming self-reflexive on what we are practicing, and especially in light of what has come to be seen in New Orleans as a celebratory tradition will be difficult, will be contentious, but it is necessary. In the meantime, as we work through all that, Bruce Ayemi Jackson was born in New Orleans. He grew up there, and he cares about the systemic challenges that we face in the African descended community. And he has developed a spiritual and communal, he communal healing practice. Ayan Yemi was a member of Donald Harrison Jr.'s son's um, black masking group called Congo Nation. And what uh, um, Ayemi is uh, a drummer. And so he has formed the Ile Alofoshe, which is the house of his particular Igungun. And he was told that he needed to tend to his aunt, Igungun is his family ancestor, and he was told he needed to attend to that. So in 2012, instead of feeding the drums on Mardi Gras morning, because you know that's just so much, he moved it to Lundi Gras, the Monday before Mardi Gras. At this event, special attention is given to feeding the drums and to uh, replenishing the neighborhood's ritual sites 
to, for, to empower them, to empower them so that they can continue their spiritual communication with the residents and to, and to gain support from the ancestors. A Kalinda Laveau uh, is a Louisiana voodoo queen who formed the Mystic Seven Sisters. She is rekindling the, f the feminine energy and cleansing of the streets um, and, and making it safe and sacred once again in her ancestral tradition. And this is um, Kalinda just this past Mardi Gras. I have a lot of people to thank, and I have one last thing to say. In conclusion, these maskers have created a variety of ways to create a connection with a divinity that has um, had a hand in helping African descended people survive. The goal of my project is to encourage revelers to look and ponder at the variety of faith traditions that on Mardi Gras Day meet on the aesthetic battleground of the public square. These spiritual practitioners call revelers to a different type of seeing, to a divine seeing, to hear, to feel, to heal, and become imbued with the gods, those which have been abandoned, those which have been reclaimed, and those which have been newly created. The focus is on cultures and dialogue, ex dialogue expressed by sartorial creations in their pageantry, displayed in sanctified performances at the intersection of the neighborhood street, carnival, and the world of the spirits. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? OK. Thanks so much, Kim. That was amazing. Um, my name is Cynthia Becker, and um, I was born and raised in New Orleans. And so seeing all of this makes me really homesick, I have to say. And your presentation was really amazing, because you could really just see the vitality and beauty and creativity among communities in New Orleans. And so my first question to you is, um, I can tell from your presentation that you have a really close relationship with people in the black carnival community in New Orleans. So can you talk about this relationship and also what drew you to this project in the first place? One of the most important things that, um, you know, even though I grew up in New Orleans, when I started doing this research, people were just like, well, you just flew in on the plane, you know, because I had been away. They didn't know me. I was from a different neighborhood. And so trust is everything. Respect is all important. The idea that you have to respect each individual. And, um, and so I have, I have learned so much from them because I consider them the ones producing the knowledge. We as scholars sit, observe, and point out how it may be related to one thing or another. But it is, it is their knowledge. Um, so uh, I have spent a lot of time, because I want this in their voices, because one of the things that I noticed was that there were a lot of white male scholars who had interviewed a lot of men who've passed on, 
and it was sort of static. It was looking at the authenticity, but I wanted to know what the intentions of the people acting today are. So through interviewing, through participant observation, um, through saying, I'm talking about you like this, which I did for each and everything that I showed, I called each person to say, this is how I'm presenting your material. My conclusions are my own. I don't necessarily feel like I have to justify that to anybody, but if I'm going to represent you, I want to know that it's accurate, that there's nothing there that you necessarily are displeased with. And so I did contact each and every person. Um, and so I became interested in this because, um, well, especially the part of spirituality, because as I was able to live in New Orleans and was seeing a person here, a person there, with a spiritually inflected suit, I began to realize this is not just a, a one-time event. There is a real spiritual turn that is conscious in the tradition. Um, now, there are some people uh, who say they're just, you know, this is not the tradition at all. But there is a spiritual turn, and I think it's important because as as our African-American customs become commodified, commercialized, and in some instances watered down, there are other people for whom secrecy uh, is important. It was, they used to be secret societies. Ritual is sacred. I had a discussion with Kalinda. I'm not saying everything. I don't want to reveal everything. People don't have a right to know everything. And so, you know, is this what I can, what I can present? Um, and so I just think, I want to I encourage that. I want to encourage the spiritual inflection because that is really the meaning of, of carnival. And this also leads to my second question is one of your images of Victor Harris and Fayaya. There was a man with a camera who was extremely prominent in the middle of the photograph. And I've been to carnival many times and I've seen the presence of so many cameras during the parading. So can you talk about how photography has impacted black masking Indians and baby dolls and skeletons, all of those traditions that you've talked about? Right, so you can tell from 1981 that the, um, the baby dolls were not concerned about people with cameras because all of those pictures would have been faded anyway by now. But today, you, the, the, the cameras interrupt the procession um, people come in from all over the world, and you know they don't know that people leave room in a procession because certain things have to happen. Um, they just say, "Oh, there's an opening. I can get a good picture," and you know they they are you know they're disrespectful. They don't learn that they used to have rope lines, especially you know the second line traditions. They would have rope lines that would say, you know, here's where our performers are and here's where everybody else needs to be. Uh, but one of the things that really has happened and has caused a lot of consternation is that people come in, they take the pictures, and then they go sell the pictures. Mm -hmm. And that's a, real, that's a real issue. So one of the people that I've interviewed who I didn't present, he writes copyright on his, on his suits, you know? <laughs> um, uh, but it is disruptive because it's not about being there and, and being in the Mardi Gras and being in the, the spirit and being in the experience. It's about capturing the experience. But I participated in the Leeds Carnival, the Caribbean Carnival, and as we processed in the UK, Everybody, now they don't, you know, they just stand on the side. <laughs> um, but everybody just had their camera, and it was like everybody was looking through their camera, mm -hmm. row after row. And so it, now it's a mediated experience. It's not an embodied experience where you go and you are with, um, you know, with the people who've decided to mask, that you are lending them their, your support and lending them your spirit, because suits just don't become Mardi Gras. Um, satorial creations. They have to be activated, and they're activated by the community accepting them. The community will wait outside the door of a person that they know is coming out, and they'll say, you know, and they'll wait, and you'll be waiting there an hour or two hours, and you'll be waiting until finally the person comes out, and it's like, yes, we love you, you're beautiful, and then as you walk, it's, are you tired? Do you need something to eat? 
Um, and so, and then there are the songs and the dances and the greeting of one another. Um, that's that's the real activation of the of the suit. And um, and so some of that is is you know is is being threatened. And we could see some of that in the video footage that you showed of Sharice Harrison Nelson when she was walking down the street, then she came across another tribe or another group, and then there appears that she interacted with another woman, and then they were hugging each other and kissing and greeting. And you also talked about the hyper-masculinity of this black Indian tradition. So can you talk about the role of women and sort of how women interact with each other who are masking? Yes, so the um, presence of women, well, there, there have always been, especially since the 50s, um, chiefs bringing in their children, having a queen, a queen may or may not be a wife, because you can see that these are incredibly um, detailed works, and so people have sewing communities. So women are usually sewing for their husbands. Um, but there are more and more women who are beginning to mask, and... Um, and so the queens have a, a queen's group, a queen's council. They have responsibilities to bringing in and socializing um, the children and women in the, in the tribe. Um, and they are bold, non-shrinking violet kind of people. Uh, so uh, the idea is, it is a warrior tradition, and the women are warriors as well. And, they, and so one of the things you have to do is you have to talk about how good you look, right? You can't be shy. You gotta say, I look really, really good. I look so good, look at me in the front. I look so good, look at me in the back. You know, and then you dance, and you say, I, I can outdance you. Uh, I'm just so much better than you in every way. <laughs> and, uh, and then the other person does that. And then whoever has the best suit wins. And, uh, and, and so the women do that too. But in the end, they respect each other and even the men do that, and they, they shake hands and they hug. And if you thought that you were seeing a suit in honor of Prince, you were. I don't know if you remember, but there was a purple suit, and that was definitely in honor of Prince, because that was the year he died, or the year after he died. And so we had a big second line for Prince and everything. So uh, I want to encourage people to send in their questions who are watching online, but you have a lot of questions that were <laughs> sent in. So we're only going to get to some of them, but there seems to be a common thread through a lot of these about um, the African influence in the masking uh, traditions. And so do you see that there are practices that take on more of an African-inspired flavor and are moving away from Native American inspirations? And if so, why do you think this is happening? I'm going to tell you like this. I'm going to tell you like um, I uh, joined, I was lucky enough to be able to be invited into a tribe and so that I could learn what it meant to sew a suit. Because if you don't sew, you don't know anything um, about that experience. And as Shaka Zulu told me, because when I told him first about this project, he's like, you know, some of us incorporate African. He and his wife are initiated into an African religion. Um, when we mask, we may play some, the drummers play some of the, the songs that are traditional, but by the time we're on our way back, it's all Orisha songs by, um, you know, on the way back. And so he told me, he's like, you know, people have a lot of feelings about that because some are like Albert Morris and they say, we're not Zulu, we're not voodoo, we're not hoodoo. And so, no, we don't have anything to do. We're, we, we are representing our, either our Indian heritage or this Indian practice. The people that I am um, interviewing consciously look to their African heritage look to Africa, have traveled to Africa, or if they have not, like in, the practice, like in the case of Victor Harris, Victor Harris has not gone to Africa. But since 1984, he has taken what in his um, mind and what comes to him in dreams, the raffia. He always wears a mask. Uh, uh, and that's a hard thing to do. This is also a practice of duration as one of my um, carnival friends, scholars said, it's duration. 
it is hard. First, you got to sew all that, put it together, hope it doesn't fall apart. And then you got to walk with all of that over broken cement, in big crowds, with people drunk, with people singing, with smoke flying in your face. And, um, it's, and, and, and then, you know, and so he's got this mask on, and that's, that's, that's it's heavy. Those suits can be 120 pounds. Um, so there are some who are consciously doing this, and others who aren't, and others are, you know, even, even there's kind of like a, if I could call it like a backlash of people um, hunkering down on the original themes, the purity themes in the African, and the black masking tradition, and, and not imbuing it with African, um, you know, with, any, with anything African, because they'll say, I'm not African. I mean, there are levels in which people are accepting of their own African identity. Yeah, so it seems like there's a lot of personal choice. It's very personal how people relate to what is actually depicted on the beaded suits. So um, another question is, is membership in tribes passed down in families, or is it membership by choice? It's both. Um, but one thing you're not going to do is you're not going to just go out there by yourself and think you're doing it. Uh, you will be confronted. <laughs> uh, you, it, this is a, you know, this is something that people pass down in families. You, in, in neighborhoods, you have got to be asked in. Even um, uh, to, uh, Alice in Montana went to his father and said, I heard you're pulling a tribe. I want, to be, I want to be part of your tribe. So, you know, he even had to go to his father. Now, when Allison was ready to turn over his tribe, he turned it over to his son. When his son was ready to turn it over, he was going to turn it over to somebody who had been in the tribe but was not a family member. And the family stepped in and said, it has to be a family member. That meant the other person had to go out and start their own tribe. And so that person was, would then be looking and inviting people in. Mm -hmm. OK, I have time for one last question. So who is it going to be? Huh? <laughs> OK, so my, my question, I think this is a good ending question. How do you envision the future of African-American masking traditions and all carnival traditions, perhaps? We're focusing on the black masking Indians, but you presented many other traditions as well. So th are there any emerging trends or challenges that you foresee impacting these traditions in the years to come? Yeah, definitely the commodification and commer commercialization is a big threat to Carnival. COVID was a big threat to Carnival because many of our people are were first responders or essential personnel or whatever. And so we had a, we had a lot of deaths um, in the community. Fum um, funeral rituals could not be carried out as normal. Um, and so um, illness, cost, commercialization, uh, commodification. Um, but in that, there just is creativity in these communities that just won't quit. And that's why I wanted to end with these two newest uh, experiences of Carnival. These are people who have decided that this, this is needed in Carnival, and that is needed in Carnival. And over time, they, they, they will grow. They will put their imprint on Carnival. Um, the baby dolls had almost died out. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, after the book came out and the exhibit, it had been something that people were very ambivalent about because, you know, it came from maybe not so good circumstances. But after that, people took pride in the tradition we were oppressed. We just did not have access to a lot of jobs, and so people did what they had to do, and so it grew. Uh, the baby doll tradition has grown. I used to know everybody. I don't know most of the people anymore. And we also have more black masking Indian tribes than they had when Jelly Roll Morton, um, you know, was developing jazz uh, than in the 1950s and um, today. So um, I think this is uh, the last question I had time for. So thank you, Kim, so much for this thank really you. fascinating, really wonderful presentation. And I'm sure it's going to stay with all of us for a long time, all of those really wonderful images that you showed. 
And I also want to thank our audience who sent in questions. And I hope that you'll join us for other Radcliffe virtual programs. And you can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at radcliffe.harvard.edu. So thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of the day.